Hello everyone, I'm Boyd Hilton and um, thanks for joining us for this very special RTS event, Get the Intel on Intelligence. We're going to be looking at the brilliantly funny Sky One Show Intelligence with its creators and stars. But before we meet them and um, before you get a chance to ask your questions in the YouTube chat, uh, let's have a reminder of just how brilliantly funny intelligence is. Let's have a look. What's this thing? Okay, not far, Jerry. Here we go. So... Do it again. No, hang on. Swipe again. Which side? Swipe, Swipe it again. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, oh, crikey. It's fine, it's fine. Let me just type this in onto here. So, so, Jerry, can you just... Sorry, can you just read me from the fourth... From the... From four, what? From, from the fourth? Four. The four. There's no four. Uh, well, Do you the, mean the one? The four. No, oh, the one is the one. It's one, a, nine, yeah. nine, two, two, seven. Okay, that should be it. There you go. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Come on, this. We have a thumb thing just in case. It doesn't always work. Yeah, why didn't you do that to begin with? It's because I've been eating crisps and it doesn't always work. Back up. Back up. Back. Oh. Give me, my, give me your thumb. You. What's wrong? You very small. Oh. Okay, there you go. Okay. Okay, fine. Uh, oh, for crying out loud. Hang on, okay, let me just do I'm, the. Uh, just I'll do the retina thing. It's fine. Come on, man. You're killing me. Why is that doing like that? Hang on. Hang on. I've got a lazy eye, so sometimes I... Right. Can you lift... Can I... Oh, oh, go, go! Oh, God, this way. Go, 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 go. Uh, so please welcome the creator, writer, executive producer and star, Nick Mohammed. And hello, hello. the executive producer. The Heineck and the exec producer and star David Schwimmer. Hey everyone. Hello. Hi, David. <laughs> um, Nick, I feel it's quite appropriate in a way that we're doing this session on intelligence the day after a certain um, individual left a prominent position in politics because your show is about an egotistical, narcissistic, racist, sexist, homophobic doofus um, called Jerry. Is there was there any connection there was there a slight in, in, inspiration from from the outgoing president in the creation of jerry uh, or is it coincidence? I mean, <laughs> sad, sadly yes uh, there was certain inspiration drawn from a particular political figure who we were never ex you know we never explicitly said who that was i can't i can't think who you who you're referring to boyd um but um yeah i mean i guess i guess jerry represented a lot of those kind of ugly traits that we see of, I guess, particularly white men in power, maybe. That's not too uh, contentious a thing to say. Um, so yeah, he did exhibit uh, all those kind of misogynist and racist and homophobic, transphobic, you know, anything to mention those qualities. Uh, and he, yeah, I mean, it's kind of in, in some respects, you know, it never, it never set out to be a, a satire in, in any kind of way but you know the the more and more trump did and say um, the more things he did and say which were just becoming real it sort of thought made me think we well, can't really kind of parody that kind of stuff anymore because he 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 represents the real deal in that respect and did the character of jerry come first or did the idea of of setting a, a comedy in the world of gchq and that that kind of workplace was was that your initial idea yeah, I think that, yeah, the latter, I think the idea of doing a workplace sitcom, which sort of focused on, you know, the, those typical, hopefully accessible interactions that anyone would have if they had worked in an office, but then sort of juxtaposed against the, the sort of seriousness of, of a backdrop of national security. I guess that that came first, but it but it it came slightly hand in hand with the idea of, you know, today cybersecurity in particular you know it's all about global shared intelligence and so the the idea of 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 there being a slight culture clash in the way that the americans work and the way the Brit british work um that was still fundamental to the idea um and and then because david and i had had, had met working on a a previous pilot which which then never uh, made it to series but um because david and i had met and we had particularly enjoyed playing with this um uh the sort of status dynamic between our two characters in intelligence we'd really enjoyed sort of improvising 
that kind of dynamic a lot. And so it, it felt completely natural. I remember just telling David that I had this idea from, from the off and that when I only even had like a page, I think sort of, of an outline for it. And, you know, even by then he said that he wanted to kind of get, get on board with it. So the two were kind of more or less hand in hand. And David, I know you're a big Anglophile. I know you're a big fan of British comedy. Did you know of Nick's work, Nick, and his work before you met him, working on that uh, that show, that morning um, breakfast TV comedy that sadly never went to series with Julia Davis? Sounds like one of the greatest sit shows that's never went to series. But were you a fan of Nick's <laughs> stuff anyway before you met him and got involved in that? Yeah, I was. And um, but I, I had never, I had never met or worked with Nick, and 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 that's where the real um, joy came into play. I mean, was just meeting, first of all, he's, he's one of the loveliest human beings you'll ever kind of meet. He's just so generous and, um, intelligent and fun, naturally funny. And, and, um, just a, a, you could, you know, he's just a kind, decent man. Um, and that all comes through in, um, his characters as well. Um, but I think meeting him and then, improvising with him for a few days um there were I, I recognized right away just just what a massive talent he was and um he is and and it was just so much fun uh, it was really hard not to keep kind of breaking or corpsing as you guys say as we were improvising because he just killed me and i thought well this is not only just a joy to work with him in this way but um I just felt like, as Nick articulated, the, the kind of that little dynamic that we found in terms of the power difference, um, we we felt there was something in there, um, both because of our physical difference in terms of our appearances, um, but also in that that power imbalance. We thought, oh well, there's something there that we could capitalize on. So. And I, I mentioned the the slightly Trumpian, if we can say that now, element of Jerry Jerry's character. But I guess he's a he's he's a bit like a Trumpian character, a, a white guy with a lot of power and, and entitlement, but without the harm necessarily. He, he, he's kind of he obviously causes less harm. He's not the president for a start, but he's but he's much more likable and charming as well, isn't he? Is that what made you? And did, was the character like that from the start, or did you, did it develop over time? Um. Yeah, I mean, first to say that um, he's inspired, I think, not only by, um, uh, by, uh, I, I guess, um, our former president, um, but really by a, a lot of the white men in power who are and have been uh, enabling him, um, and um, they're just as dangerous, if not more so. Um, so. I think it was um, important, however, to realize that each of these, each of those men that I think of, all the senators and congressmen and other and others, um, um, are 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 real human beings, and they're all flawed and have their own uh, weaknesses. And the it was really important to me and to Nick that we, from the beginning, as as your question asked, really tried to find a way to make Jerry. Um, sympathetic and and what we kind of landed on was that a lot of his um, behavior and his need for power and his narcissism was a combination of ignorance um, and uh, a growing feeling of irrelevance and um, being out of touch but also a huge amount of insecurity and once we landed and found this kind of this idea that he was insecure and the reasons are we find we find out more in season two a little more about why he's so damaged uh, then you start to get a filler a, a fuller picture of of a man who is um hopefully uh, a little more sympathetic hmm. and nick i'm fascinated by the relationship between your character between joseph and jerry because it kind of developed, clearly 
Joseph is enamoured, isn't he, with with Jerry? Do you think? It feels feel to me right from the start, and that gets more and more the case over over certainly over the, the six episodes I've seen of series one. Do you take that further in series two? And what is it? Your what do you was that there again? Was the idea of of this sweet but frankly incompetent guy being really excited about the arrival of big powerful American? Um, what you were getting at? Yeah, yes, uh, that that was always there from the off. The idea that it's sort of this slightly kind of and initially what presents itself as a one-sided re relationship I guess in that Joseph is hugely enamored by this this in his eyes at least truly exotic figure in Jerry coming and you know shaking up the workplace um and I guess yeah he it's almost that it's not necessarily he's not I don't he's he's not sort of sexually attracted to to Jerry but but there is there's absolutely an attraction there and, you know they they get married and he's he is infatuated by him to a degree, but um, but I think it's more it's more he sort of sees him as he, I think I think both of the characters are, are kind of lost in their own particular way, and um, I think that you know Jerry Jerry needs someone like Joseph who who constantly buys all of his uh, I don't know if we're allowed to swear on this uh, so his all of his BS and all of his kind of flights of fancy and all of his kind of huge exaggerations, J Joseph takes at face value and kind of loves Jerry even more for them. No one else really does that. Everyone else sees through that facade. So Jerry kind of needs that um, because he's so insecure. And, you know, Joseph is looking for, you know, he's lost in the sense that he's not in a relationship. Um, he doesn't have any brothers or sisters. Um, uh, he, you know, he doesn't have, yes, he doesn't have a girlfriend or anything. And so he, He's really looking for this sort of older brother sort of figure in his life, I think. Um, uh, and he's happy, you know, jo jo Joseph is quite happy. But but when Jerry comes into his life, it's just this really exciting event. And, you know, he absolutely grabs hold of it and grabs hold of Jerry. And, and you know, this is a brilliant sort of person in his life now. And, uh, yeah, he'll do anything to sort of protect that relationship. Because I thought it's one of the funniest things about the show for me is how you set it in this world of intelligence and GCHQ, but actually the mundanity of daily life in that workplace is very funny. Um, was that, did that come from, did you, did the dreaded word research, did you meet people who worked in that kind of environment and, and talk about the kind of day-to-day -day, um, trivia, if you like, of, their, of what it's like working in, even in <coughs> such an important place? Uh, to a degree, I mean, there was there was a there was a bit of a limit as to what we, you, you know, what how much research we could do. Because I mean, I think part of the the fun, certainly as a writer, is sort of exploring that slightly blurred line of what what the audience perception is of what goes on behind the closed doors of GCHQ and what really does go on. And you know, we'll we'll never know unless we any of us start working for GCHQ. Um, but you know, I'm 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 sure. I'm sure GCHQ know the things that you know I've been trying to research about them, um, and you know they they did sort of informally sort of kind of get in contact, and you know we we were able to meet with people to sort of discuss. I think I think there was an initial concern I think from them maybe that we were maybe going to kind of target them or sort of blow the whistle on stuff, and you know it's just not that type of show. You know it's a it's a silly sitcom with national security as a backdrop, but you know the things that I were interested in are the like those mundane things that. You know, you kind of reference the what does the canteen serve on a Tuesday? And, you know, we learned that they do have a GCHQ choir and they do cake sales and they do all the things that you'd expect of any kind. Of, you know, they have hot desking and that, that you'd expect of any office environment. I mean, I, I worked for, for uh, when I finished university and when I moved to London, I, I'd started gigging as a comedian, but couldn't sort of support you know that wasn't um I couldn't sort of support myself just from doing that and so I was I was working at Morgan Stanley the investment bank during the day and um uh, in in a sort of a similar to position to sort of Joseph sort of finds himself in but within GCHQ in that I was trade support so I was kind of somewhere between IT and the traders and uh, managing quite a lot of computer systems and a lot of the time I had no idea what I was doing but but you know so, but I was aware that some of the things I was doing were actually quite important um, and slightly trying to to blag it and so some of the uh, the Joseph kind of finding himself in sort of deep water I think at the start of episode two he deletes a load of files and that that I genuinely did do that at Morgan Stanley I deleted a load of things off the server which I thought was like a mirror server so I didn't think it was going to affect 
like real life as it were and and it and it and it was it was stopping these automatic trades from happening or something and so we had to kind of go and retrieve them from the hong kong server i had to come in late at night it sounds like an episode of the show but it was it was real so if that counts as research then yeah maybe maybe that is research did you did you have a boss like christine no, I didn't. I actually had one, and I'm, I'm, I'm still in contact, particularly with Alex Billig, who was one of my line managers there. Um, and uh, yeah, no, no, they were very nice. There was a lovely bunch of people. I mean, I think I would have stayed there had I not got, I got an acting job, uh, which meant I had to go to Belfast for a month or so. And so, uh, yeah, but I, I really, I didn't not enjoy it. And uh, they, yeah, they were a lovely bunch of people. David, um, Nick mentioned how it called it silly, which I think is, is, um, is accurate, isn't it? It is joyously silly, sitcom, like a kind of proper trying to be funny relentlessly, because there is a certain fashion, isn't there, for more dramatic comedies these days on TV that explore the dark, you know, people are always talking about dark comedy. This is definitely isn't dark. Was, was, was that one of the things that appealed to you about it? I mean, I'm a fan of all kinds of comedy. I love dark comedy when it's done really well. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure I'm a fan of a lot of shows that are kind of dramatic comedies. Um, I, I guess I, it's just a matter of taste, isn't it? I just thought the idea and the characters, the, the whole setup, the situation of the situation comedy, I thought was inherently original and, and really funny. So, um, and also e equally important to me was just being able, uh, the opportunity to work with Nick and to, um, because I, I just really enjoyed his company and I enjoyed working with him. And, um, and uh, I thought this, we'd have a lot of fun improvising as well on set. Um, so in fact, that whole sequence that you, uh, that you've, that clip that you showed to start us off, um, that entire sequence was improvised. So um, that, that to me is the, is just, I, I, I just feel incredibly grateful um, to be, to have a job in which you know you get to go to work and just just have fun and, and try to make <laughs> try to make people laugh it's it's um just very uh humbling mm. on, the, on that clip. comedy oh, oh. sorry but i was just going to say boyd on the, on that kind of comedy the the kind of silliness of it um i, I mean f for me i mean there definitely has been a fashion of late that 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 i think a lot of half hour comedies are actually you know they fall into comedy categories often but but i think would more accurately be described as comedy dramas and and you know i, I actually enjoy a lot of those shows that's not to disparage those kinds of shows at all but there was there was absolutely no question that you know that this would be an outwardly uh, sort of sort of bare, bare chested co comedy and it's kind of uh, gag rate i guess and it's um it's it's silliness um and you know i think there's I hope that there's sort of space for that still in, in, in comedy because it feels, I, I don't know whether it's because I have a background in live comedy or it's certainly kind of when I was first starting out, I was doing a lot more live stuff and um, you kind of, you're desperately trying to kind of get to the gag because, you know, that's what keeps an audience on, on side or, or particularly that was the case for me and the characters that I, I was doing. So I kind of wanted to definitely do the same, but on, but on television with, with intelligence because you know, it just feels like th there weren't too many examples recently of shows that were absolutely putting comedy first and foremost above emotion or drama and sort of storytelling. And for me, it felt like I really want to make a show that's, you know, got, you know, proper, proper laughs in and, and lots of them in a, in a short space of time. And, you know, that's because of the influence of so many great shows. Friends is one of them, you know, a huge gag rate. But, you know, e you know, even the more uh i guess shows even as nuanced as, as the office still absolutely always always you could you could count the gags and fleet you know fleabag's a brilliant example of a show that's so amazingly triple threat but it undoubtedly always will put comedy first i mean you know phoebe turns to the camera and delivers a punchline every 20 seconds every 15 seconds and uh you know i, I shows that can just make you laugh again and again and again we're always the sort of driving force between sort of wanting to make a a, a silly comedy really yeah that's interesting because david you obviously yeah you were involved in, in, a, in a sitcom that went on for a while that had 22 23 episodes a season and was had writers rooms i guess and in the classic american sitcom style this is the very british isn't it version of 
a six part per series written by one man. Um, uh, did you, was that difference interesting in going from that American sitcom style to the British sitcom style? Um, well, oh, yeah, I mean, um, I, I don't really find that much of a difference in when we talk about uh, British versus American. Um, there, obviously, there's some some references, cultural references, and there's a, sometimes a different difference in humor, but I think funny is funny. Um, the main difference was our process. I mean, Friends was a, was in front of a live audience, four cameras. It was like doing a one-act play every week um, with, you know, where you got to rehearse four days of the week and then you do it in front of a live audience. You know, our process on this, obviously, it's a single camera. Uh, sometimes we were able to use two cameras at once to capture the scenes in which we knew there was probably going to be a uh, high likelihood of improvisation. Um, but, you know, it was um, it was more like shooting, you know, shooting a movie or, or a, a single camera uh, half hour comedy is or, or drama is is much. It's a much different animal. Um, I, I mean, I I love both. Um, I really enjoy both processes. And the fact is, as um, because I'm also a creative partner with Nick, you know, involved in the casting and you know, the stories that he's breaking and able to kind of pitch in, um, as well as the edit and every, all of post-production with Nick. Um, and of course, our great director, Matt, and our incredible producers. Um, you know, I feel like, I feel like um, that collaborative spirit that I'm most kind of, um, I most enjoy is totally satisfied doing this show, so. Right. So Nick, so even though Nick, you, you write the whole show um, yourself, you're, you're, you're the sole credit writing, but actually you do collaborate with David and the director, et cetera, on the, 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 the arcs of the stories and the, yeah, is that right? And so it, talk us through that writing process. <clears throat> yeah. So what, what usually happens is that I would, uh, I mean, so just to sort of, I guess, talk through series two, um, the, I would, kind of come up with a broad outline for the series which we would run past uh mm. sky as well as 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 basically every kind of all the exact so david uh, david's business partner tom um charlie producer neris and morwenna uh, the execs expectation and um at that point we would sort of just make sure that there was nothing broadly speaking that any of us weren't really on board with or that we're going to be a problem for the for the channel or anything like that and that we were happy with the general kind of arc of it and then yeah you just sort of drill down into detail so i would work quite closely um with uh for, for this series it was just with andrew ellard um he's a brilliant story producer script editor and um we would just dive into a little bit more detail about i guess more the structure of the episode i would often come up with you know what every episode sort of should be about and what the main thrust of it. And I would do an outline myself and we'd just sort of talk that through to make sure it was structurally sound as it were. And then, yeah, then I would go away and write a first draft. And then pretty much from that point onwards, it becomes incredibly collaborative. So we, you know, once I've got a first draft, uh, you know, about five people will kind of pitch in with, with notes and thoughts, occasionally alternative suggestions for jokes and stuff. Some of which, you know, I might choose to kind of, put into the script and some of which we kind of park and we know that we'll maybe shoot alternatives on the day and just keep those in a separate document um but you know we we kind of we just sort of do that and then we'll do a second third fourth fifth pass usually is then what what would become the shooting script but then on the day you know in the in the shooting of it you know there were days uh, you know there were there were plenty of days when we would just do it absolutely by the book and we wouldn't even improvise you know a, a single line but there are other scenes and uh, times when it, you know, it called for it, where we felt that there was further places to go, or we were inspired on the day, and um, and you know, f everyone, all all the cast were able to sort of chip in. I, ho I hope that we kind of were able to kind of create an an environment where people felt that they could have a play with the material, and we absolutely would capitalise on that because you know we had, like David said, such a wonderful cast and a brilliant director in in Matt who would throw in ideas as well on the day, and 
and and yeah and even now i guess and now we're in the edit for series two you know we're making decisions about you know whether we need to dial up certain storylines that we've got in there or kind of uh shy away from certain things if we feel that um they're not quite working or or you know in the grander scheme of an episode we want to kind of put those things a little bit more in the background or save them for a later episode so so yeah i mean it's it's you know, it, it is, it's written by me. I write the scripts, but it is truly collaborative in, in every sense. And, um, and, you know, and a better show for that. Absolutely. Um, let's have a look. We've got another clip now. And one of, one of my, one of the funniest scenes, I think in series one, um, the lie detector scene. And let's, let's have a look at that. And then afterwards we can talk a little bit about how that was put together and if there was any improvisation, but let's have a look at the clip first. You take it. <laughs> I have no problem taking a polygraph. Wait. So how did I do any of these to label to mark me up? I don't know. I'll try, but your score was really on the fence. Which side? Okay, listen, so I kind of painted myself into a corner here. I might need to cue you at certain times in the testing. What do just you mean? to pick Well, d it doesn't matter. But what do you mean cue you? What's Joseph doing here? Yeah, I'd like an impartial adjudicator on this, someone who lacks the mental capacity to skew the results. Fair enough. Should be fun. You ready? Nearly. Are you, are you right? Yeah. Oh, I, uh, I have a little twitch that comes out once in a while. It's nothing. Um, Chris, do you want me to run through a few trial questions first just to make sure the equipment's working? Yes. You are right? Yeah. Uh, so, answering yes or no, what is your favourite film? The Greatest Showman. Have you ever taken any illegal substances? No. Uh, there was one time at the NSA when I had to sniff a work surface, but it turned out the entire work surface was covered in crack. Yeah, that seems to be working fine. Great. Shall we begin? Uh, to, mm, hold on, just let me... <sighs> <sighs> yes. 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 Two months ago... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Listen, I really think it's only fair if all the questions come from Joseph. Okay, uh, how many legs have you got? No, you, you don't have to create the questions, they just have to come from you. Oh. Two. Two. Yeah. What does that say? Redacted. Okay. <clears throat> Two months ago, GCHQ intercepted a... Redacted, Redacted sorry, file from the Oval Office implying a cover-up within the NSA. Yes or no, were you aware of such a cover-up? <laughs> no. It says no. What the fuck? I mean... Move on. That didn't count. Uh, ask another question. Um, what's a tampon? Not, not you, one of her... Sorry. Despite requesting upgraded access to your internal file at the NSA, it still comes up as classified. Why? Oh, thank... I don't know. However, when speaking with several senior figures at the NSA, it seems your move over to GCHU was more to do with damage control. Why might that be? Can we take a break? Yeah, I... No. I think I might... Sneeze, actually, um, and I don't want it to affect the test. Fine, I'll wait. <gasps> I might be a minute. There's so much going on in that scene, um, but... So to what extent was that scripted, fully improvised, et cetera, Nick? How, 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 how would you describe that? I think, I think it was, because it, because it's a three-hander, um, it kind of, it, 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 was, it was quite tightly scripted, but, but the places where we would have fun were in, I mean, I, I, yeah, we're like with David, with Jerry's um, sort of nervous tick, and um, particularly, not so much that scene, because there was quite a lot of storytelling to be done in that scene uh, in terms of the exposition of what Christine is trying to get out of Jerry. So obviously we kind of couldn't really improvise too much around that. 
Otherwise, it, it would have, I think, uh, been a bit sprawling and, and uh, sort of taken away from the story. But particularly that episode and some of the other lie detector stuff uh, that we that we did and which I think is in the first half of that episode. I mean, tons of that was improvised, partly because we just set up this lie detector and and David is in for real pretty much because he was doing all the testing at that point before he took the hot seat in that clip um he would um basically grill all of us and just ask us real questions and we were connected to this live sex machine and, and you know he would just throw in anything he wanted so a lot of that was improvised um uh but yeah it was it was a really fun 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 bit to shoot um David, so for example, things like um, the fact that you, your character's favourite film is The Greatest Showman <laughs> seems perfect. Was that, or did you, you know, were there other options or was it always going to be The Greatest Showman? Yeah, so that that's an example of what Nick, um, <clears throat> Nick was referencing earlier, which is that we'd always have like a, a little folder of, of alts, you know, so, but the, the Greatest Showman, I think, was our, was our communal favourite. Uh, for Jerry's favorite movie in character. Um, uh, yeah, but I'm, I, I can't remember now, but I think we had like three or four alts to that. Um, and just to say, I just want to add in watching that, which I, I hadn't seen in quite a while, you know, the, you know when, when Nick had scripted, um, redacted, you know, when his character even though he's he asks what the word what what is this word and Christine his boss says redacted and then thirty seconds later he can't read the word, <laughs> so that's a moment where, for me, I just so enjoy when a performer like Nick like takes what's scripted takes what's on the page and then runs with it and and then, in addition to that. Christine and I, who are adversaries in the scene, suddenly we bond for just a moment over, over Joseph's, like not being able to get, to get <laughs> his incompetence, basically. And it's those little performance moments, I think, that are not necessarily scripted, but that's, that, I think, is the comedy gold when you have um, a character-driven ensemble comedy like this. Um, those are some of my favorite kind of bits. Absolutely, yeah. And Nick, even your little question about the tampon is, is you could always miss it because you, you just slip it in there, but that's that's such a kind of random, wild choice of question. <laughs> was that scripted, Nick? Was that scripted? I can't remember. Yeah, it was, it was. And I, I remember that one of the options for Jerry's favorite film was, was Babe 2, Pig in the City. Oh, right. <laughs> Okay. But the greatest showman, I think, was a little bit more uh, of the time. Uh, it felt it felt more relevant. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, now, series one went out, I think, about a year ago, just as um, COVID was arriving in our lives. Um, and series two is coming up in spring, isn't it? Was there? I guess the big difference was that you had to film series two between lockdowns, but with, I guess, with COVID safe measures. How was that whole process? Um, I think it, it was a challenge. It, I mean, <laughs> it was. Ahead, it was. Nick. I mean, it, no. What I was just going to say it was. You can't. It, it's weird, kind of, how quickly you kind of get used to the, you know, the protocols of the the, the mask wearing on set, and you know, we would only really be, kind of, masks off when doing takes and so on, and you know, we were quite a lot of testing uh, was involved, and you know, we, but we were so lucky. I mean, it. It helped a little bit that it is a you know a relatively small cast and it is pretty much filmed in one room right it's and it's a studio so we, we can you know relatively speaking isolate ourselves and and um, not necessarily have to come in you know it's not like we're going from location to location and having to come in contact with lots of different people so yeah it was mm. difficult I, th I think the the thing that I missed the most was just you know you can't you can't socialize obviously and so. You know, there were no, when, when we would have lunch, you know, you can't really socialise and have lunch. You just sort of go back to your separate dressing room and, um, you know, we couldn't have a, like a wrap party or anything like that. You know, not, not those, those things aren't essential by any means. But, um, you know, they're little things that are, are nice when you've been working uh, closely with people for, you know, six, seven weeks uh, of, of the shoot. So, yeah, it's little things like that. But, you know, by golly, I don't want to 
stress enough how lucky we felt to be able to be working again and, and filming and um that that felt very special that we were we were able to, to to do it and we know we could only ever do it if we were doing it safely and um you know the fact that we were able to and fortunate enough to to be able to get that done and to get it all in the can you know i heard a lot of you know horror stories of productions that had either started and then had to shut down because of lockdown and pick up you know eight months late six months later or whatever and uh you know we we were just really really lucky that you know we managed to kind of get it shot uh, when we did and you know to get david over and tom over as well from the states um and back sort of safely and you know with all the kind of quarantining and everything that kind of goes with it so you know it was it was tough but you know i i hope that you can't tell when you when you watch season two <laughs> that you know we had i think we obviously had to have a few less uh, fewer essays um, in the background uh, <laughs> because you know there was a limit to how many people we could then have in the room at any one time. But um, but yeah, uh, it, it was a, a tricky but you know heartwarming process still to be able to be working again. Yeah, and I just want to chime in there. I mean, I think the, ent the entire crew, um, everyone should just feel really proud, proud that we we were able to do it because everyone just took it so seriously, took such responsibility over everyone else's safety. I mean, it was a real example, I think, of, of everyone just, you know, thinking of everyone else, basically. And, and no one, you know, touch wood, no one, no one was, was sick, even though, you know, there were obviously family and friends around were, were maybe falling ill um, everyone, you know, everyone treated, treated it and took it so seriously that, um, we were able to, to go without stopping a uh, production, which was, um, something I think everyone should be really proud of. Uh, and, um, yeah. And as Nick said, I, I mean, I think, I, I think we, we, we made some funny stuff. I guess, I guess you guys will be the judge. So. Have you, Nick, have you ratcheted things up in series two, would you say? Because, you know, that um, this feels like a show to me that could go on for years and years. And, you, and you, as we get to know the characters more and more and better, you could do more uh, more stuff with them, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I hope I hope so. I mean, I, 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 I don't mean this as flippantly as it sounds, but I, I sort of saw series one as a a pilot and i don't mean that in, in that it'd be a very expensive pilot if that was really the case but i just mean for, for me as a as a writer um and and you know you know you just you just learn so much from that process and you know this was the first tv series that i'd written you know on, on my own and uh you know i felt that i learned so much and you know you're you obviously apart from david obviously i knew was going to be doing this the, the part of jerry and i knew that jane Stan S was going to play Mary, but everyone else we, we, we cast. And, you know, it's not until it's such an ensemble show as well. It's not really until you kind of have that ensemble on the set and you're shooting and you're kind of playing and you're looking at the different dynamics that you, that you really know exactly what show you have. And, um, you know, there are, there are a lot of voices on a show like this and, you know, the channel have, have particular views and I have, and, you know, David might have, and the director has, and, you know, we all have to kind of collaborate and, you know, we're sort of we were forming the show you know by process in in particularly with series one and what what was then a joy to be able to then go on to series two was knowing exactly what works what relationships we haven't explored yet but we know will be uh, exciting from what we've already kind of seen um uh the way particular characters um deal with particular situations and how we might be able to sort of subvert those in in, in in different ways in series two so i would say that you know i i, I feel uh, and again you know like like shrim says you know everyone will, will will be the judge but um i i'm, I'm super proud of, of series two in particular because i think it really has hopefully capitalized on on what we kind of all learned on on, on series one um and uh and i think delivers far far more um as a series partly because we know who these characters are now and uh, i i hope I'm, you know, hopefully new audiences will find the show as well. But um, I think that particularly people who really enjoyed season one and uh, will will get a real thrill from seeing where we take the the characters in in this coming series as well. So yeah, right. Okay, I can't wait. Um, the questions are coming through uh, on YouTube, so I, I'm going to ask a few of these. 
Um, one is, when you come up with a risky joke, how do you decide if it's appropriate, especially considering every nation has a different sense of humour? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think uh, th there are there are enough people involved with the show. And, you know, we had it even in, in series t two, where there's a particular episode which deals with um, sort of uh, like anti-harassment within the workplace. They have to go on a, a, a course. Someone comes in and has to do a course. And so naturally, some of that territory, when you're talking about uh, anti-bullying, anti-racism, um, sexual harassment, these are really sensitive subject areas. And you have to handle them and deal with them very carefully. But you also have to shine a light on them, I, I, I personally believe, um, because I think by shining a light on particular areas of these, you can really start to you know, deal with um, quite serious issues, even in a show as, 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 as silly as intelligence. I think it's important to, uh, to do that, uh, and you can do that. And there's almost a platform for doing that. So, uh, but, but that, that particular episode was, was a really prime example of where we were able to, to air, you know, everyone was able to kind of air particular views. And we were making line changes on the day and sort of little tweaks to particular words even where we, where we wanted to kind of tread that fine line but never cross it. And, um, you know, particularly with, with Jerry's character, you know, he'll come out with outrageous stuff. And, you know, the joke is always on him, always on him. But you never want what he's saying to just feel gratuitous or that we've just sort of given him... Uh, you know, the, a, a particular insult because, you know, we can. And so we'll just do it for sort of shock value. We, we always try and justify it. And um, I would hope that there are enough uh, voices and minds on the show that we do by part of the process kind of almost get the kind of the average opinion on, on, on whether something is, is, is the right side of the line and can go right up to that line in terms of it being risky and, you know, treading a, treading a fine line in terms of, uh, you know, not crossing that boundary and uh, but never over overstepping it. So, you know, we do that. We also shoot a lot of alternatives if we think that we're going to just need them, particularly from a compliance point of view or a legal point of view. Um, uh, we'll shoot alternatives. Um, but a lot of them get kind of ironed out in, in the writing, you know, from from script stage. You know, it's pretty it's usually then pretty clear, um, uh, you know, whether we need to kind of relook re at a particular scene or, or something. Uh, with, yeah, and just to chime, know. just to chime in there too. I mean, I, I don't find comedy that's that safe very interesting. Um, I think it's kind of the role of comedy to 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 push push boundaries. Um, having said that, I, I do, as Nick said, we rely on our own judgment and our own taste, and we have a group um, that we. <laughs> Uh, that we form a consensus, and if something is too too much for someone, then we respect that, and we we discuss it. Sometimes we we fight passionately for what you know we we want, but we have we, you know we we work as a collective, um, and so far I think it's it's working. And also you know we shoot a lot of alts. Anytime we there's going to be a joke or something, a remark usually by my character that is inappropriate or potentially offensive and or is offensive you know we we always shoot a bunch of alternatives um so that when we cut it together and we see how it's playing that that's really the final the determining factor is is um having some distance from it watching the whole episode together and as long as it's always in character and um you know, again, we trust our collective taste. Oh, that's, that's fascinating, yeah. Um, another question from, from you two is, um, are there any similarities between the characters to your real life personalities? David, do you have an inner, wildly inappropriate, entitled doofus? <laughs> I mean, um, I, I would like to think there's very little I have in common with, the, with Jerry. Um, uh, but that's the reason I, I was so excited about playing him, um, to play such a narcissist um, and, um, you, know, you know, racist, homophobic, misogynist, uh, insecure man um, who, you know, are, make up a lot of our world leaders, um, and, or if not our world leaders are... Um, at least in my country, a lot of white men in power right now. 
Um, I, you know, that, that was the cathartic reason to play this guy. Um, so it was, um, it was, it was a way of taking all my actual feelings about <laughs> some of these men and, um, kind of exorcising them. <laughs> and I, yeah, I think, I, I mean, I probably do share some similarities with Joseph, maybe, maybe not so much now, but certainly, uh, uh, earlier on, like in my, in, in, you know, my career and in my life, just when I maybe lacked uh, that kind of confidence that I maybe have now in terms of, you know, sort of slightly blagging my way through stuff because I wasn't really even confident <laughs> enough to say that oh, I, I don't understand or I don't know. But um, I'm, I'm hopefully not as tactless and as daft as, as Joseph in, in real life, but it's very fun to play. Um, and, you know, even more fun to play against the kind of the bullishness of, of, uh, of David's character. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, someone's asked um, whether there are any new actors coming in for series two that you can tell us about, any new characters you can tell us about. I guess there's a core, isn't there, kind of five or so characters. But any, 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 anyone you can tell us about? Um, well, uh, I, Morgana Robinson uh, is, uh, is in... A, one episode of the show uh, has done a brilliant, brilliantly funny guest lead. Uh, she is a person who is leading the um, the anti harassment uh, session, um, and has particularly uh, unique methods. Uh, and um, I don't know if we're allowed to say who, because I know that Sky wants to announce uh, who else we have uh, who's going to be playing uh, Joseph's friend, who he befriends online, and uh, and they basically basically forms the basis of a relationship with him and um i don't know if we're allowed to say uh just because i know um sorry, don't want to annoy <laughs> um uh, but um but i know but but colin salmon uh pops up more than he did in series one which is brilliant because he's so such a gent and so brilliant uh and lovely and um yeah we've just got everyone else who we kind of love coming back uh, we've got um uh uh elliot, elliot salt who obviously plays Evelyn Christine's PA. Um, she has a lot more to do in this in this series. I think she's absolutely terrific and very very funny. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't think I I don't want to kind of give any too too many spoilers away or anything. But um, hopefully Sky will be announcing who else is in the show very soon. But it's really exciting and an absolute pleasure to have those uh, additions to the cast. And um, yeah, it's just a shame that we couldn't kind of obviously hang out more than than, than you know all we could really hang out was on set. But um, but yeah. Lots of fun. Yeah, well, I look forward to finding out who, 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 who's going to be in it. Um, someone else asked on YouTube, um, Nick, how did you move from actor to, they say, writer slash director? Um, uh, <laughs> uh, how did I move from, what, what, was, what was the question, sorry, but how did I go from how actor to writer? Yeah, just, I guess the, I guess, I, you know, the, how do you find the writer? Do you find the writing of this show, the first show you've written, you know, yourself how did you find that process especially I, my feeling is with, when you have so many gags in it you know there it has, has got proper gag rate is that a challenge particularly um it, it, uh it's very yes yes and no sometimes it comes very freely uh the kind of the the, the, the writing of it of, of the kind of the dialogue and what, what 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 i really enjoy with this show and particularly series two we've got so many kind of ensemble uh, sequences now in in the show, as well as you know a lot of the kind of Jerry Joseph stuff and the Jerry Christine stuff, which works really well. But um, what what's really fun as a writer is writing some of those ensemble scenes and just knowing that you kind of got, you know, your five six characters who who can all kind of chip in with their own particular type of gag or their own particular sort of world POV on a particular whatever subject it is that they're discussing. And so it feels like there's a there's like a kind of a pool of uh, sort of resources to kind of tap into because they can you know and, and a lot of the time those conversations unravel in ways that we don't expect and we kind of hear something about someone's home life or something that we don't expect to and some of those are really kind of those those elements are, are really kind of joyful to, to write so and then other times it just feels very obvious when there's a, a section often when we're having to do the storytelling and some of the exposition of the show and you know, I, I, I will always push for more more and more jokes if we can manage it. And sometimes those jokes will then get in the way of the storytelling and you have to sadly take them out because, you know, the audience still have to follow the story. Otherwise, 
you don't quite have an episode uh, if it doesn't sort of have a have a sort of story of the week aspect to it. So um, so yeah, and in terms of going from an actor to to a writer, I mean, because I'd always I'd always written like my own live my own live stuff and uh, Edinburgh shows and and so on. So I was always. And, and the more recent Mr. Swallow shows had been ensemble pieces as well. So uh, it didn't feel too big a leap to then go from writing uh, that to kind of writing half hour television. And I had experience from writing and working with, with Julia on Morning Has Broken as well, a lot of which stemmed from Im improv. But, um, but yeah, I, I guess the trickiest thing is more the other way around is that when you are, when you're filming scenes, is to try and take the writer sort of hats or heads or whatever off and just sort of focus in on the acting and not and not kind of worry so much about the, the words anymore and sort of trust in the writing process and now sort of park that and know that that's done and now just act and, and perform so that you can find those little moments that David was talking about where you kind of connect with other actors. You kind of want your proper acting head on to be able to do that and... Uh, you don't want to be distracted necessarily by overthinking the writing by that point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, another YouTube question, if the setting hadn't been intelligence, are there any other industries where these characters could play out? The Met Office. <laughs> I thought the Met Office was, uh, was an interesting one. Um, uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, ultimately, they're just a collection of absolute oddballs and it's all about their sort of mini power plays that might not mean anything to sort of anyone else outside of that particular work environment. I mean, maybe with GTHQ affecting national security, that, that doesn't quite work, that reasoning. But um, but I would like to think that you could you, you could take some of these characters, although everyone has kind of got um, affiliations with those, 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 those sort of a Mary type or a Christine type or a Jerry type or a Joseph type, sort of wherever they, they work. I mean, I think um, it could be fun now that you mentioned it to, you know, that maybe series three or four, you know, Jerry does something for his, for his country and gets the uh, appointment of, you know, ambassador, US ambassador in the UK. So suddenly, and brings Joseph along with him. Um, and. So it's the whole world of politics could be interesting <laughs> to see those two. I'm I'm really keen on I'm really keen on season four, if we were to get season four, um, <laughs> being uh, being the flip of the show where where yeah that kind of what David said, but but Jerry gets an elevated position within the NSA and brings the team with him so that they're the ones who are the fish fish out of water um, in an American in, environment in, in America, yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Oddly enough, the, the, the next question I have from YouTube is, will Jerry go back to the NSA in season, in season two? Well, we keep dangling that carrot, that's for sure. <laughs> we can't give anything away, but, you know, there's a lot, yeah. on, that. There's a lot on that. You also, you brilliantly ended season one with a little twist, a little um, revelation. I won't spoil it in case people haven't watched. They can watch the whole of series one right now on Sky and Now TV, by the way. Um, but it is a show, isn't it, where you can have a little kind of spy-type storylines running arcs running like almost little mini john le carre things going on which i'm not, which for me adds to the whole joy of it yeah that's that's fun to be able to kind of dip into that and we all we all enjoy just play you know playing with some of those ideas and you know again without giving anything away i think i think that series two does that even more because, you know, we're all kind of comfortable with this workplace. I think that, you know, people now know what they do for a living and what their jobs are. I think, you know, we, we like to, I like to think that we're kind of taking things a little bit further on, on that front as well. Brilliant. Well, I think, um, I think we've probably run out of time. I was, we were going to show, should we show the, let's show the final clip, shall we? And um, because really, I think what this clip um, shows more than anything is the ensemble, this brilliant ensemble that you that you've got of characters. Um, let's have a quick look, and we'll we'll just we'll end the the session with a quick discussion of the rest of your cast after we have a look. Chris, seriously, I mean, Joseph and I have already made excellent progress honing in on a suspect, and I mean, from a career point of view, wouldn't it stand you in good stead for a position at MI5? What makes you think I want to work at MI5? Doesn't everyone here want to work for MI5? I just assumed this place was like a holding pen. You have two minutes to convince me. Go. Excellent. Joseph, show her what we've got. OK, so I have written a program that, fingers crossed, should be able to predict whether the person behind this cyber attack is male or female. Just to narrow it down. 
And once you've narrowed it down to half the population, what do you plan to do? Knock on each of their doors? That's what Santa does. Sorry, that was a joke, obviously, just to take the edge off how you're looking at me. What Joseph means is now that we have a working program, we could start to add in all kinds of different parameters. Like what? Well, like whether the person behind this is a known cyber terrorist. Well, surely if we knew that, we'd know if they were male or female. Yeah, that was a bad example, so I was really need the loo as well. The point is, we're going to hone in on someone. And for the record, I very much doubt this is the work of a woman. Why? I don't know. I just have really good instincts about women. For starters, why would a woman hack the NHS? Huh? It's just not a very womanly thing to do. The fact is, if you're a woman, you are far less likely to be a terrorist. Thank you. See? Yeah, but we are not making the same point here. I actually uh, once got stalked and searched whilst wearing a hijab. Why were you wearing a hijab? I just got it from a charity shop. Didn't actually know what it was. It isn't that offensive? Oh, gosh, sorry. No, don't apologize to me. Apologize to Joseph. Not why? In that your area? I've never worn a hijab. Sorry. That's all right. Ah, male. Ah, there you go, see? I was right. Great, so we know the person behind this is a man. Go and tell him I five. Right. I see what you did there. Actually, no, there's a, so there's a confidence interval on that. OK, so there's a 40% chance that it's a man. So a 60% chance it's a woman. No, that can't be right. OK, great, so we're looking for a woman now. Yeah, I think for absolute safety, let's tell MI5 that we're looking for either a woman or a man. Or why don't you stop wasting mine and everyone else's time and focus on something more tangible, shall we? I, I, I'm glad we had, we had time to show that clip, because it does... It's a reminder, for me, like, that your, your cast... They're, they're, they're actors who immediately inhabited those characters right from the word go, and we felt like we knew who they were. Was it hard to find those people? Because they're not necessarily... Um, actors we've seen, you know, you'd instantly know from TV. Um, I, I think it, it was it was it was it was hard in some senses in that we did do a, a quite a large casting process. But but one thing was for sure was that when those people, so Garner who plays two Jane, I, I wrote the part of Mary for Jane anyway. Um, but um, for, for Garner who plays Tuva and for Sylvester who plays Christine, what was really clear was that when they came in and did their castings right from the off, they were just absolutely the best people for, for those roles. I mean, they were, they, you know, they inhabit those roles in, in ways that others didn't. And um, it was just such a thrill, uh, you know, to, to sort of hear it kind of come to life in that kind of way. And, uh, and I think we just, look, we just look like such an odd bunch. Like when you put all five of us next to each other, like, it's not it sort of feels like it's unlike any other show really and that in that respect just purely on on that it just looks very different and you know that was a big a big thing for us as well i think and david did you get involved in the casting as exec producer etc yeah yeah <clears throat> we were uh, very very involved uh, we did all the casting in london um and it was you know that to me is is one of the most um enjoyable parts of the whole process is as nick said when when that person walks in the room and and it it becomes a no-brainer uh really in in the best case um in the best case scenario um it it just uh you you so clearly see um the the role that that nick created totally inhabited by that person by that actor and um yeah, I mean, I, 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 I thought it was a. I remember it being a little more um, challenging to find, you know, find the the right the, you know, the right people. Uh, but as Nick said, when they when the person does come in the room, um, you know, everyone kind of looks at each other when they, you know, when they step out, and and everyone's kind of like it's an immediate kind of like, oh yeah, well that's that's the person. So it's yeah. it's really fun. And the, ad, the added benefit of, the, you know, they are, you know, our, our ensemble is one of the nicest groups of people. And that was one of the joys of doing series two, you know, notwithstanding lockdown and everything that uh, coronavirus and everything that kind of came with that in terms of the pressures of filming around it. But um, just just the nicest bunch of people that you could and so collaborative and so open and, and uh you know, we, we're, we're so fortunate to have such a brilliant, talented ensemble. I mean, they're just incredible. Which is, which is very important, I guess, yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, God, um, yeah, yeah. We have run out of time, but the, the, the one thing that a lot of fans are mentioning on YouTube is bloopers. They want to see bloopers. Um, can you create a blooper reel, please? We'll get, we'll get on it. We, we have a lot of bloopers, particularly from the wedding scene, and uh, which took, it was filmed on like the hottest day of the year. And we all just, I think we became sort of mad or delirious. And it took, I mean, as in like, it took dangerously long to film to the point that it became incredibly unprofessional. And uh, we were properly told off for it, <laughs> uh, but it was just very, I don't know why, it was just the combination of everything going on in that scene and what everyone was wearing and, singing and sounding like and loads of stuff but um but yeah we'll we'll try and get on it because i know that there are some bloopers and i, I yeah we've we've seen those requests pop up on twitter before but we'll i think we'll be able to do something ahead of ser series two going out that'd be nice yeah that'd be good more bloopers of the more more texts of the two of you kissing in that wedding scene that i think that would be obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's there's plenty of those Good, good. Um, thank you so much, Nick and David, for, for, for joining us in this session. Um, and I want to thank the RTS and I want to thank all the fans and all the people watching on YouTube around the world and everyone who's asked a question. Thank you so much. It's been brilliant. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, boy. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>